Dr. Borromeo opened the door to the hospital's isolation ward. He explained to the SS soldiers that the Jewish patients there were isolated here because they had a horrific, extremely contagious and highly fatal disease. A few of the patients began coughing, a wet, nasty sound. The Germans backed away, terrified that they'd been exposed to Syndrome K. The doctor's plan worked perfectly. The Fate Benefratelli Hospital is in the heart of Rome, on a small island in the middle of the Tiber River, just across from the Jewish ghetto. Founded by monks, the hospital has a long history of rising to the challenge to address the current needs of the local community. During the 1656 plague outbreak, the hospital focused on care for plague patients. In 1832, during cholera outbreaks, the hospital was recognized by Special Commission of Health for its treatment of patients. In 1943, under the guidance of some very brave and honorable doctors, the hospital once again rose to the challenge and served the local community as it best knew how. Founded in 1555, Rome has one of the oldest Jewish ghettos outside of the Middle East. The area consists of a few narrow streets. The ghetto is walled in with three gates that backs up to the Tiber River on the far side. The ghetto was created with the idea of limiting Jewish influence in Rome. However, many inhabitants liked the idea of a special Jewish community where neighbors had the same customs. Throughout the centuries, though, the Jewish population was only a small part of the overall Roman population. They were a culturally integral part of Italian society and for the most part lived in harmony with the non-Jewish neighbors. Around the time of World War II, the majority of Rome's approximately 12,000 Jewish citizens lived in the ghetto. During the 1930s, as Italy fell into fascism, anti-Semitism increased. In November of 1938, Mussolini's fascist government implemented the Italian racial laws. Basically, these laws stated that Jews were a separate, inferior race and restricted in their civil rights. Among other rules, Jews were banned from public office and prominent positions. More anti-Semitic laws quickly followed. In the town of Ancona, a young Jewish doctor, Vittorio Sacerdoti, loses his job at a public hospital. Upset, he turns to his uncle, Marco Almagia, who is a medical professor. Marco contacts one of his former students, Giovanni Borromeo, who is now the head physician at the Fata Benefratelli Hospital in Rome. Dr. Borromeo is a strict Catholic but also anti-fascist. He hires Dr. Sacerdote, treating him with great respect. Dr. Sacerdote moves to Rome and begins working at the hospital under false papers. He becomes well known in the ghetto and Dr. Borromeo is considered a friend to the Jewish community. On June 10, 1940, Italy declares war on France and Great Britain enters World War II. Italy will go on to sign allegiance agreements with Germany. Nationalism is on the rise and anti-Semitism continues to grow. At the Fata Benefratelli, three doctors, Dr. Borromeo, Dr. Sacerdote, and Dr. Adriano Osaccini worry about fascism, anti-Semitism, and the growing threat of war. As doctors, they feel they have the crucial calling to save lives and are committed to serving anyone who walks into the hospital. Dr. Osaccini becomes involved with a secret alliance of anti-fascist doctors and monks. The doctors also develop ties to a network of resistance fighters. They are supported and encouraged by Father Maurizio Bialik, a patron of the church and liaison for the hospital. In July of 1943, the Allies invade Sicily with plans to advance to mainland Italy. The same month, Mussolini is voted out of power and the Italian racial laws are suppressed. Several weeks later, in September, Italy signs an armistice with the Allies. As a result, a furious Germany invades Italy. In the regions of Italy that come to be occupied with the Wehrmacht, the racial laws are heavily enforced and made worse. Germany overruns the Italian countryside. Larger cities, including Rome, are not quite so easy to take. On September 10, 1943, citizens, including members of the Jewish community, fight back when Germany advances to Rome. The clash comes to be called the Battle of Porta San Paolo because the majority of the fighting takes place near the Gate of St. Paul. It's an unfair fight, mainly ordinary citizens and limited militia with guns and homemade weapons against German tanks and artillery. While the citizens are sacrificing their lives to save the city from occupation, the king, the royal family, and high-ranking government officials abandon the city. Sadly, the citizens fail, and by the evening, Rome is overrun with SS soldiers. The wounded come to the Fata Benefratelli for treatment. By this time, the hospital has become involved in the resistance. The doctors install an illegal radio transmitter in the basement and pass along information. Also, a resistance group is printing leaflets and the hospital is used to smuggle their flyers and disseminate them to the public. Nazis begin occupying Rome. A few weeks later, Herbert Kapler, commander of the SS and the Gestapo in Rome, threatens the city's Jewish community. Unless they hand over 50 kilograms of gold, 200 Jewish family heads will be deported. For a while, the Jewish community has heard rumors of concentration camps and other physical dangers of Jews in other parts of Europe, but it seems far away. They conclude that as long as they come up with the gold, there won't be a problem. With the help of concerned non-Jews, the Jewish community scraped together the gold and paid the blackmail by the deadline. Many hope that paying the gold will be the end of it. 
Meanwhile, Dr. Sacerdote and other community members implore the people not to trust the Nazis. For the most part, the Vatican has kept silent about the treatment of Jews. Pope Pius has political ambitions and plays both sides of the field, even hosting diplomatic events for the Nazis. Around 6 a.m. in the morning of October 16, 1943, a woman runs door to door in the ghetto warning her neighbors that the Nazis are coming. Soon, some 365 German security and police forces show up and block the exits, sealing off the ghetto from the rest of Rome. They are implementing the final solution. They are systematically sweeping the ghetto with machine guns and dogs. They round up residents, men, women, and children alike. They force everyone onto huge trucks with tarps covering the back. Those who try to refuse or beg are beaten with machine guns and dragged through the streets. Some Jews are able to escape or hide before the Nazis arrive. Others escape as the ghetto is being sealed off. They climb over the rooftops of ghetto buildings into Rome. The escapees seek refuge with neighbors, friends, and family that live elsewhere in Rome. The Nazis end up detaining 1,259 people, 363 men, 689 women, and 207 children. Shortly thereafter, the non-Jews are released. The remaining prisoners are held for a few days and then loaded onto Holocaust trains and deported to Auschwitz. Of the about 1,035 prisoners sent to the concentration camp, 16 will survive. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Dr. Sacerdote is alerted by a friar as to what's happening. He runs to the analysis lab, which looks out onto the hospital square, Piazza San Bartolomeo. Across the square on the far side of the river, Dr. Sacerdote can see an SS soldier dragging a little boy and a woman carrying a small suitcase. They're loaded into a truck. Dr. Sacerdote is upset, but there's nothing he can do. Mid-morning, a man comes into the hospital looking for Dr. Sacerdote. He's escaped from the ghetto and thought that Dr. Sacerdote could help him hide. He quickly admits him to the hospital as a patient. A few more Jews show up, and the doctor admits them too. His reasoning is that he can keep them safe at the hospital by hiding them among the regular patients. A quick staff meeting explains the idea. Dr. Borromeo suggests the Jews be admitted having contracted a highly contagious disease. That way, they could be kept isolated away from the other patients who might be suspicious. They name the disease Syndrome K. Herbert Kapler is Nazi police chief overseeing Rome, while Albert Kesselring is a Nazi commander who led troops into the city. It's a way to poke fun and bring a little humor to the situation. Also, in German, Syndrome K sounds something like existing conditions Krebs or Morbus Kolk, which were the German names for cancer and tuberculosis. The doctors decide that the symptoms of Syndrome K are headaches, vomiting, and a nasty cough. It's 100% fatal, and those who suffer from it will die a painful death. They also come up with credible progression and a medical description of the disease. Word of mouth spreads that the hospital is a sanctuary. Dr. Sacerdote personally admits 27 patients as the other doctors admit even more. Mainly Jewish patients, but also some members of the resistance are on the run from the Nazis. Soon, they have close to 50 patients with Syndrome K. Dr. Sacerdote spends hours typing up case files to add credibility to the patient's conditions. As he works, he listens to a banned transistor radio turned to the resistance broadcasting from an illegal channel. Pope Pius is disturbed when he hears the Nazis have rampaged through the ghetto. However, he declines to make a public statement condemning the raid of the ghetto. Soon, the Nazis become aware that the hospital has Jewish patients. When they inquire, Syndrome K is mentioned and it's explained the doctors are studying these patients. The Nazis have no trouble believing the Jewish people who they think are dirty and somehow less than human would catch such a disease. The hospital is beginning to run out of space for admitting new patients. The doctors, members of the Jewish resistance, and members of the clergy hatch a crazy plan. The Fata Benefertelli will continue to admit Jews, resistance fighters, and anyone else under threat from the Nazis. Using their printing resources, a resistance network will falsify documents, giving patients new identities that hide their backgrounds. Then the patient will be moved to another sanctuary, be it the home of a good Samaritan, a convent, a monastery, or out of Rome entirely to hide them in the countryside. Patients only stay at the hospital as long as it takes the network to move them to another sanctuary. The system is entirely based on trust. The Nazis offer a bounty of 5,000 lira for turning people in. This is a good sum of money for an individual living in a city ravaged by war. The hospital also continues to smuggle leaflets as well as guns and other supplies. The Nazis suspect something is going on at the hospital, but they aren't quite sure what. Dr. Osicini is arrested and held in prison a few times. He refuses to answer questions. They beat him with bags of sand so as not to leave bruises. However, he comes from an aristocratic family and has strong connections to the Vatican, which quickly gets him released. Dr. Sacerdote at this point is living at the hospital. It affords him a measure of safety. He doesn't dare venture off the island. There are rumors of a bounty on his head. Dr. Borromeo stays at the hospital too, but sometimes goes home to his family. He carries with him paperwork that bears the seal of the Vatican. Showing his documents to SS soldiers is generally enough to make them back off and let Dr. Borromeo go about his business. However, the documents are questionable. 
They're signed by a high official, Giovanni Battista Motini, the Secretary of State who has limited powers and doesn't directly represent the Vatican. Interestingly, in the future Motini will become Pope Paul VI. Time passes. By early spring 1944, Rome is beginning to starve. The Nazis requisition supplies. The Allies are fighting their way through the Italian countryside, and sometimes from Fata Benefitelli they can hear the sound of distant bombing. The hospital rooms become full again, as it grows more and more dangerous to smuggle people. Supplies begin to run low, staff is dispirited. The Nazis are becoming more and more suspicious that something is going on at the Fata Benefitelli, but they can't figure out what. One day, Dr. Sacerdote is alerted by a child that two trucks full of Nazi soldiers are heading toward the hospital. Dr. Sacerdote runs up to the analysis lab to look out. Sure enough, two trucks are coming. He springs into action, hiding and destroying contraband. The doctor disassembles his illegal radio and throws it in the river. If he's caught with the radio, the Nazis would link him up to the Freedom Fighters, a likely death sentence. As it turns out, God is on Dr. Sacerdote's side. Just before they turn off the bridge to the hospital, the first Nazi truck turns around and doubles back. The second truck wasn't behind them anymore. They went back to see what happened to it. This gives the doctors an extra half hour to hide items and prepare for the Nazis' arrival. When they finally arrive, several SS soldiers march in, along with a German doctor and translator. The lead soldier politely but forcefully demands to see medical records. It's clear they are not going to take no for an answer. Dr. Borromeo comes out and welcomes them as they head physician. He treats the Nazis as if they are visiting colleagues and takes them on a tour throughout the hospital wards explaining why various patients are there. Soon, the tour arrives at the isolated ward where the Jews are kept. Before they go in, Dr. Borromeo warns them that Centrum K, the disease these patients have, causes neurological degeneration with dramatic consequences. It's extremely contagious and highly fatal. Anyone can catch it, but Jewish people are more susceptible. Even before Dr. Borromeo opens the door, they can hear some of the patients inside coughing. The lead soldier forces the German doctor into the room and follows him. The other soldiers mill about in the entryway, unwilling to enter. Even more patients start coughing, and the Germans quickly back out of the room. No one wants to catch Syndrome K. The Germans depart Fata Benefertelli still suspicious but cowed and terrified of the Syndrome K. The plan worked like a charm, including the doctors teaching Syndrome K patients to mimic a tuberculosis cough. Hospital supplies continue to be stretched thin. Rome is near its breaking point. Citizens are barely surviving. There's no mail. All information is word of mouth. Buses and streetcars cease to function. There are long bread lines. People gather dandelion greens and other edible plants to eat. At one point, an explosion kills a horse, and people come to strip meat from the carcass. Planes fly overhead, and the bombing gets closer. The distinctive sound of the USB-29 can be heard. Sometimes there are air raid signals resulting in long stays in shelters. The smell of smoke, along with the oppressive weight of dread, lingers in the air. After resistance fighters set off an explosion resulting in German police deaths, German security forces come down hard. They arrest a leader of the resistance and torture him. Dr. Borromeo is worried that the leader will crack and give up the hospital. The Nazis begin to unravel the plot. In May 1944, SS soldiers raid the hospital and detain five Jewish patients. They also destroy Dr. Sacerdote's office and arrest Dr. Borromeo. This time, friends in high places aren't enough to get him out of jail. But the Nazis have bigger problems than the Fata Bernafatelli. The Allies are pushing toward Rome, so many begin to retreat. After several skirmishes which leave German legions in wreckage, the Nazis abandon the city. On June 4, 1944, American troops finally march into Rome. Everyone comes out to celebrate. The soldiers throw chocolate and gum to the cheering citizens. Some cheering Jewish citizens publicly shed their robes. They've been hiding as Catholic monks. About 80% of the Jewish citizens of Rome survived due to the efforts of the doctors at the Fata Bernafatelli, members of the clergy, resistance fighters, and many kind non-Jewish citizens. It's not known exactly how many Syndrome K patients passed through the hospital, but historians estimate over 100 people. Dr. Borromeo, who died in 1961, was recognized as the righteous among the nations on October 13, 2004, by the Yad Vashem Memorial. This honoric is used by the State of Israel to describe non-Jews who risked their lives during the Holocaust to save Jews from extermination by the Nazis for altruistic reasons. The three doctors, Dr. Borromeo, Dr. Sacerdote, and Dr. Osicini, as well as the Fata Bernafatelli Hospital, have received other awards and tributes as well. Check out how a teenager fooled the world into believing that he was a doctor. The Nazis performed all sorts of horrific experiments on prisoners. Here's what happened when they tried to sew twins together.